thank you to our show sponsors, FMC Preschool, U.S. Borax, and Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry and fail to understand your needs, Adama is here to deliver. And we're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and uh, it is wonderful to see everyone here again on this Monday night. Uh, wonderful to see some familiar names and some new people as well. Ken does not enjoy our music, and I want to know, Ken, is it the first music or the, like, techno second music? Because if it's the second one, I'm not sorry. It's probably my favorite jam we've ever had. Um, all right, so tonight... Uh, we are going to talk about canola establishment. Super excited to get into this one. Uh, but of course, before we do, quick reminder to all, if you do collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow, and we'll have the feed up for you there. Um, and you can let us know you watched and get your CEU credits. Okay, so super exciting to have these two gentlemen joining me tonight for this discussion. We've got Mr. Jack Payne, and for the first time on The Agronomist, Mr. Robert McDonald. Welcome here. Hi, Jack. How are you doing? Really good. How are you, Lindsay? I'm doing well. Thank you. Good. We had a few, like just before going live, a few things we had to edit. So we did. Um, and uh, so hello to Jason. He's here from Manitoba, Jason Vote. And Ray DeBanco has already got a snide comment in about the princess crop that is canola. So that's setting the stage, I guess. Do we agree? That'll be my first question. Robert, do we agree or disagree that canola is a bit of a princess crop? I never really thought about canola in royalty terms, oh. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, but now's your, it can be a bit of a princess. Yeah. And we are using this, of course, in the not so great light. Um, and I'm going to agree with that one. Jack, what do you think? Well, well, it's a good crop for, for uh, insects, diseases, establishment. I mean, it's always a good crop to talk about, right? Yeah. Okay. Jason adds, it's more like a diva. Yes, maybe. <laughs> now, there was a honeymoon phase. We know that. Just like with soybeans, there was a honeymoon phase when canola came on the scene. But of course, now it has become this cornerstone, uh, really, between canola and wheat for the prairies. Um, it is just so important for our farmers. And, uh, and you're right, Jack, no shortage of things to talk about when we talk about canola. So I am pretty excited for that. Okay. So there's more than a few things I want to tackle tonight. I did pull a couple clips, one of which is from uh, quite a few years ago. I think we're on six years ago now. And uh, it's it's with Neil Harker. It's, it's a good one. And I'm going to make sure I get it in there uh, because I love looking at what we'll call older clips and seeing if some of that still holds up. So I'll start with you, Jack. First question, when we're thinking about canola establishment, what do you think, if you could narrow it down to one thing, what do you think is the one uh one key point that farmers really should be focusing more on than they do currently seeding depth mm. it's still an, it's still an issue um not just in canola but other crops and and i'm just thinking back to the last few years now that i've been back in the field more um you know peas lentils canola you get out in early spring and you start digging around and uh, we've still got some issues of uh, trying to maintain uniform seeding depth Okay, so that's so that was my next question. Is it that we're too shallow, too deep, or that we're all over the map? All over. All right. Sir, so you, you'll find tough. seed on the surface, and you'll find seed two and a half, three inches deep. Sometimes Not in ideal. the same field. In the same field, sometimes. Right. Um, all right, Robert. What if you could narrow it down? What is the one thing we need uh, to be working on, focused on? Well, we'll talk about uh, seeding depths. Jack brought it up already, so I'll bring up another one uh, that is related and but extremely important: seed to soil contact. Mm. Yes, I love this. Okay, these are good ones. There's lots. There's lots to unpack here. Um, oh, Rob, you may have you may have frozen a bit, so we'll see if that connects. We did have to do a little switcheroo uh on the equipment there for rob so we'll see if that catches up here um <laughs> so ray says too hot too cold too wet too dry too deep too bad i don't know if we're so 
I don't know if we're that bad off with Canola. Uh, Robert, I'm sure will come back. Uh, yes. <laughs> bye, Robert. I'm sure he'll be back. Um, but one of the things that I definitely will will say for Canola, as much as maybe we want to chide it a little bit for having so many things attack it, it also can, as you, you know, from that field of being on the surface of three inches, it can still produce a pretty decent crop. So yeah. is is that elasticity of this plant part of what makes it such a great fit for the prairies, for farmers on the prairies? It, it is, Lindsay. I mean, it's a very plastic plant. And and over the years, there's been quite a few times when, you know, I've, I've been encountered or run into, you know, reseeding decisions. And always, um, you know, uh, I think Canola Council would, would be on board with this, but usually it's give it some patience, be, be patient with it, give it some time. And uh, in, in many cases, most times, um, you're better off just letting it ride it out. And even though it's a pathetic looking thing, a terrible looking crop, uh, it is really surprising how it can bounce back and can fill in. And, uh, you know, um, you can have a, 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 it almost looks like a disaster and actually come out with something that looks okay. So it is, uh, yeah, it, 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 it trying to get, I guess, to the top yields, that that's where it gets, you know, a little finicky trying to fine tune some things. But getting a, a, a good basic crop, getting something going in the ground in the spring, whatever, it, it's a fighter. It, it is too. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. It's definitely one of those that we do have to give credit that it can recover and fill in and really surprise you at times. Now, um, we also deal with some later season things that can sort of eat into that yield, but uh, we're going to focus on early part of the year for now. So um, we'll wait for Robert to uh, to pop back on. And I do see Ken has already mentioned one thing in the chat that we will sort of touch on tonight, but we're not going to spend our whole uh, agronomy discussion on that um but we do have certainly some questions about planting versus drilling so before we get to sort of that the machinery pass and what's so important about that seed to soil contact and seeding depth i did want to touch on uh weed pressure first um and really on those tough to kill the koshas the you know the herbicide resistant or multi-herbicide resistant weeds Jack, you're in an area that is dealing with some of that, of course. How are you managing through, especially sort of in the the pre-seed burn-off decision? Well, that's that's a key one, Lindsay. I mean, kochia, again, you talk about uh, plasticity. I mean, again, it, it's the, almost a perfect weed uh, as, 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 a, as good as a crop. Uh, it, it can germinate early. It can germinate when it's cold. It comes in later flushes. Uh, it's a survivor, um, so kochia is a tough nut to crack. But really, when you talk to agronomists and, and people that are weed scientists, really getting a jump on kochia in the spring with the pre-seed product um, is, is crucial, absolutely <laughs> crucial. And, um, you know, uh, now because we've got resistance, we've got, you know, triple resistant uh, kochia, group nine resistant, group two, um, without getting into a lot of discussion on products, you know, I, I'll just suffice it to say, you know, there are still some pretty good options out there with group 13, group 14, group 27 chemistry. So um, I would encourage producers and agronomists to, when they're looking at canola, you know, uh, we've, we've still got some options. However, it's getting a little bit scary that they're talking about, the, you know, that uh, group 14 resistance. So yeah. we don't want to overuse um, uh, the tools that are in the toolbox because again, uh, that could uh, blow up on us, but we still do have some, you know, say 13, 14, group 27 chemistry that, that we can use. So uh, we're not in a corner yet, but uh, that would be where you'd want to focus uh, your, your pre-seed on. Um, and absolutely, I mean, there, I know there's always questions about whether should I use a pre-seed or not. Um, I, I think in mm -hmm. most cases, you know, uh, electing to use a pre-seed treatment um, is, is the way to go. It, it's absolutely, you, you need to clear up a lot of that early competition. Again, we're talking about establishment. Let's get the crop off to the best, uh, the best foot it can. And we don't want to be fighting weeds right from the get-go. Right. And, and certainly for your area where water has been scarce, um, whether that's been sort of soil recharge over the winter or, you know, in crop, how key is it then to, to have that canola plant growing and not other things? Well, exactly. You know, it, um, he who is out of the ground first usually wins. 
So, you know, in, in, when we talk about plant and uh, crop and weed competition, it's, it's really that one. And then the other uh, uh, fact is, you know, he who has the biggest root system will often win. So, you know, again, early establishment, uh, the, the plant that's got a, a well-established root system uh, has got the ability to compete for water and nutrients um, has got the leg up and has the advantage. So you want to try and stack the deck in your, in your favor for, for your canola crop. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, Rob has tried to hop back on. He's going to try again. It might just be you and me, Jack. I'll be honest. Okay. <laughs> um, so we're just going to keep rolling with it. We have more than enough to talk about. I really, there's obviously some things I really want to ask Rob about. So if we can get him to reconnect here, then we'll roll with that. Um, but, uh, until he is back that does we can switch gears maybe a little bit here um so we've got some ontario uh people of course on this call and they of course look to winter canola but and that's perhaps gaining in popularity in ontario which is kind of cool because we've got a new, hold hold on to your seats jack we have one variety for winter canola mercedes that's it one so seed selection is super easy um but there's a couple questions coming in um that really does speak to you can treat it sort of like a soybean or a corn crop but also you can literally float it on and harrow it in and still get a crop and so john says he tried winter canola but this has this still happens john in western canada in a wet year um and that is you know floating it on or flying it on um and actually trying to get a crop so we have that range. And then there's a few other questions about, um, hi, Rob, we can see you, uh, we can hear you, um, which is yay. Okay, this is good. But then we've got the question of drill versus planter. So we can go all the way from flying it on all the way to a planter. So how do you make the call on really what what is the best option? It, it depends on your circumstances. And, and again, I, I guess, and, and like you say, Lindsay, I, to be honest, you know, uh, when I moved to central Alberta, um, you know, I was encountering still growers that were broadcasting and harrowing in uh, canola. They, they didn't, they didn't use a drill. They, uh, they didn't use an air seeder that that was part of, that was standard practice. Um, again, they didn't have a lot of crop residue to deal with. So getting that seed to soil contact that uh, Rob's talking yeah. about was, was key. I have seen that though uh, backfire on on people again where you've got heavy residue and the seed gets hung up in in the, in the crop and mm -hmm. the straw, and then you've got a bit of an issue. But again, it goes back to that plasticity of, of canola. Yeah, you can you can get a, a, a decent crop with broadcast. Um, going in, in in whether or not you're going to use a seeder or a drill, um, you know the drill is much more precise. Um, it does give you that ability. Um, to be more precise with your depth and with your rates and it's a higher end so you know with, with the drill um you've got the uh, the ability to cut back on your seeding rates if you're looking at those uh you know the planting recommendations for for uh you know uh let's say five to eight plants per square foot if you're down on that low end um it does give you more precise placement you've got better control over that and your actual planting rates so the drill is is gives you that higher end management um the air seeder would sort of fit in between um and again gives you though again the the ability to cover a lot of ground it's a little bit better on on some in some in terms of some aspects of, of planting or, and with fertilizer but uh, again yeah you can go precise or you can go basic Right. So Robert, while you're here, and I hope this is to stay, welcome back. I hope so too. Um, yeah, exactly. So let's, let's touch on, and then we're going to, I'm going to go to the clip here just after this, but let's touch on that, that all important seed to soil contact. So when you hear things like, you know, floating it on, which in, if it's your Hail Mary last you can do, what can you do? Or drills, your cedars, planters, what is more important to you on getting that seed to soil contact is it really all about the equipment or is it about how it's set and the operator well really when we're talking about seeding and using you know the range of platforms technologies out there it's really about consistency in performance and that's really what you're trying to drive is consistent performance under a wide range of conditions you know what um uh, a nice 
good rain after uh, day after seeding, it almost doesn't matter what you put it in the ground with. It may, you know, I, I call them hero rains. You know, you get that nice yeah. shower, uh, you know, even better, a nice light snowfall after seeding. It doesn't matter what your drill is, whether you've pulled something out of the fence line or you've got the latest, greatest technology. What improvements in seeding technology bring are consistency and performance under a range of conditions. And mm -hmm. what you're really targeting is really simple. Get that seed a quarter inch below the moisture layer. You know, not at the moisture layer, below the moisture layer so that you've got some protection. If it does, you don't get that hero rain, you get a hot, dry condition after. So that's really, really, as, as far as the goal, and we're talking generally about seeding depth, that's, that's rule for me. That's rule number one, get below the moisture line, not to the moisture line. I think that's been a mistake in the past. It's burned a lot of, uh, a lot of growers is seeding to moisture. It's just a bad idea. You got to seed below it. Yeah, that's, that's, I wanted to make that point. The other point with this, you know, gradation of drills, uh, gradation of seeding equipment from, again, from, uh, air, air seeders to drills, to, uh, to, to planters becomes very important, uh, when we look at our seeding rate and what type of, what type of response we expect to get in terms of emergence, because, uh, you know, Jack made the point already as we're targeting populations, say, say you're targeting five plants. Well, you really need to, again, get consistent performance out of your drill in terms of, in terms of emergence. Like we can talk more about emergence, but I just want to make those comments on, on that kind of that dynamic over the different pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, it's a great way to look at it. So my question, I think then is to follow up on, you know, hitting just under moisture, let's say, do you think there's a hesitation because it's such a small seed and we worry that we'd be, you know, just burying it way too deep? That's a great question. You know, uh, we, we talked about surface broadcasts and, you know, I started seeding canola 33 years ago and, you know, anybody who was seeding canola 30 years ago remembers if you didn't see seeds on the surface, you simply were seeding too deep and you were really worried. And I can remember just walking crop after crop, waiting for that ground crack, waiting for that rain and, you know, just being such a nervous time. I don't honestly remember the last time I worried about a canola crop uh, really, coming really back. coming up because we're, we're pushing to deeper seeding depths. Certainly the hybrid seeds definitely uh, demonstrate a much better ability of getting out of the ground uh, more effectively under a wide range of consistent and, and again, driving that consistent emergence uh, uh, out of the ground. And so very comfortable at seeding, you know, targeting an inch. Now the, you know, uh, yeah. Jack mentioned it earlier in his comments just before I lost my internet connection. Uh, you know, as far as, you know, the consistent that we're, when you start targeting seeding depths, that's when it gets, and you start targeting deeper seeding depths, that's when the consistent performance of the drill, rank to rank, left to right, front to back on the drill become critical because that's where we lose our population when you know, you, you, you haven't uh, leveled your drill in five years and your rear rank is seeding an inch deeper than your front. So, you know, you've got to, you know, uh, canola doesn't come up nice at two inches, plain and simple. So you, you have to keep it more shallow than that under all circumstances. And uh, uh, that's where getting that drill to perform consistently across all the openers becomes so important. All right. Now, Jack, would you, would you agree that it is more dangerous to leave it on the soil surface with modern hybrids than say putting them in a little too deep? Well, when you ask, you know, agronomists, what, what the best seeding depth is, you're going to get a wide range of, of, yes. of recommendations. So, and, and you, you know, um, you know, if you look at standard recommendations, half an inch to an inch, okay, that's, that's, that's the perfect, um, that, that's the perfect scenario. Um, I'll agree with Rob. I, I think because of the the new varieties and and that hybrid vigor, I have seen fields where growers have gone to an inch and a half because they had to go. They wanted to go to moisture. We've had some dry years, um, and I've seen some canola that uh, was down an inch and a half. And you're going, man, that looks too deep. But you know, again, um, these new varieties are fighters, and uh, you, you can get a, a decent catch. I'll also say, Lindsay, when dry conditions, and we've had some dry conditions in southern Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. southern Alberta, uh, and last year was 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 one of them, the spring. 
Uh, I saw a lot of canola, let's say that was seeded and it had been in the ground for three weeks, went out, we were checking fields. I was seeing a lot of uh, seeds stranded in that half inch uh, depth that was bone dry. And again, they couldn't imbibe any water. So they just sat there. And uh, right. so um, are you, do you play with fire and go deeper to an inch and a half and you know, below an inch to, to, to get to some moisture, to get the crop growing? Uh, if it's if it's seeded at a half an inch, it's just going to be stranded in that dry soil, and um, then you're then you're waiting for that uh, that rainstorm. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, at that point, it's not a, it's not a hero rain anymore. That's a salvation rain, there, Rob. Well, like to put it into perspective, um, the w w you know we can talk about the variance across a drill, even a really well set drill. If you can get a half inch variance across the drill, you're doing awesome as far as, you know, controlling within a half inch. So if you're targeting half an inch and you got a half inch variance, you've got seeds that are on the surface, plain and simple. There's, there's no way around it. That's why talking about a half an inch it isn't really uh, a, a secret for success. We also have to think about when the conditions are less than ideal uh, and how much quicker that top half inch dries out. You know, when the wind's blowing and how quickly that desiccates. We've had a few years, of, you know, uh, uh, in recent memory where we just had these strong, uh, strong winds in May and high temperatures. And we had enough moisture to germinate the seed, imbibe the water, you know, radical came out. And then we saw the wind and the heat come and just chase that moisture away. Yeah. And I could find thousands of seeds with that were desiccated in that zone. And I called that, I called it the kill zone. That was a kill zone, that half inch, those half inch seeds were in the kill zone. They were all, they all germinated just fine, but they just never had a chance to survive because it just got too hot and hostile in that zone. That's why I like pushing them in a little, little deeper and protect them. Mm -hmm. All right. Jason Vote uh, adds here in a drought, they've put canola in two and a half inches and it worked fine. So, um, and yes, sometimes Manitoba does get dry. So there you go. That's where Jason is in Southern Manitoba. Okay, we have to quickly, uh, we are going to go to uh, Producer Jay. If we can go to the clip with Neil Harker. So this is the one I promised we would get to. It's from about six years ago. And he covers, uh, in this clip, I did shorten it down. He covers a couple of good things I want to talk about. Uh, it's going to give me a chance to catch up with the chat. There's some great questions about large seed versus small um, and some of the rotation questions uh, that we've got coming in as well. But Jay, if we could go to the clip with Neil Harker and then we'll hear a shout out to our sponsors. <laughs> Caleb, uh, you were on a panel uh, discussion this morning talking about canola stand establishments. And some of the old rules do apply. We'll call them old rules. Yeah. Um, but there is some interesting things you brought up this morning in terms of things, getting growers to think about some things a little bit differently in regards to stand establishment. Mm -hmm. uh, let's start off with speed versus depth. Okay. Well, yeah, we, we've done quite a few uh, experiments on, on comparing uh, depth of seeding with the speed of seeding. And we've had them both in the same trial, and so we know uh, which one's more important. And over the years, we we feel that depth is is the biggest factor. Uh, now, the the complicating factor is is that if you go really fast, well, then the depth can change because the back ranks of the cultivator will throw more soil. So, uh, speed does influence depth in some ways too. So, well, I think some of the trial results you show some of the pictures, it really shows that uh, just focusing on speed. But you know, say you, we're going to go super slow uh, and sort of foregoing the focus on depth, you're really like, there's no gain to be made whatsoever. No, that can be problematic. I mean, if you're down uh, two inches or more with canola seed, a tiny seed like that, doesn't matter how slow you go, they're going to have a tough time getting out of the ground. Yeah. But so, well, some of the focus now on precision agriculture, you know, we talk about precision planting and those kinds of things, we, we've seen some growers really focus on bringing. Uh, seed population or seeding population back you know, to one and a half pounds per acre. Some you know, some pretty low numbers compared to where we were at one time where we, a lot of guys were seeding closer to seven. Yeah. Do you have concerns in that area? Yeah, I have a lot of concerns with that. I think uh, there are a few factors. Uh, one of them is uh, people have been using different planters and going back to discs and where you can get a little more precise depth control and a little better seed placement sometimes. Uh, but also, 
in, at the same time, in the, over the last two or three years, especially in 13 and 14, we had really excellent soil moisture conditions. And so they did all those studies under really excellent soil moisture. Then you come to a normal year and uh, all the great results uh, turn to dust. Yeah. So uh, I'm a little worried that once we come under more normal conditions that these really so low seeding rates are going to hurt us. Our sponsors for The Agronomist are Adama Canada, FMC Preschool and U.S. Borax. Understanding the interplay of macro and micronutrients is important when choosing fertilizer products and agricultural practices. The ag team at U.S. Borax are experts in boron's role in soil and plant health, including how boron deficiency can limit yield even when sufficient macronutrients are applied to the soil. Backed by decades of field research and lab studies, we can provide recommendations tailored for your specific soil solution. Go to borax.com radio for more information. All right, so many, there's another three minutes to that clip. And I don't know about you guys, but I could listen to Neil Harker talk all day. Um, and so, so kind of neat to see. So that was from six years ago. And since then, of course, we've certainly, as he, I suppose, was Sue saying, we've sort of returned to some of those more average to extremely dry conditions. And so let's talk uh, seeding rate, choosing your seeding rate. We've talked about depth and the consistency there, there's still probably more to touch on there, but this dovetails into the, the question of mortality, a seed mortality, but we'll get there in a minute. But let's talk about choosing a seeding rate. Neil there was saying, you know, we were cutting rates, we were using planters, and we certainly are seeing more of that on the prairies. So does these sort of five to seven or five to eight plants still hold true? And are we using that as a rule of thumb? Jack, I'll start with you. Well, that's certainly the you know the recommended standard we're at. Um, I, I guess my thought on 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 planting rate is and, and plants per square foot. If you're dialing down to that five to six plants, or and, and we 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 pretty much assume that we need five plants per square foot to to make a viable crop. Uh, so if we're in that lower end of the range, then we we have to make sure our ducks are all in a row on all of the other factors because we don't have a lot of wiggle room. Um, you know, um, what, what, what are we going to have for weed pressure? What are we going to have for insect pressure? Uh, what's the weather going to be like? That sort of thing. So, you know, having a few extra plants per square foot does give you a bit of a buffer if things go sideways. Um, so the thought is, if you're going on the lower end, you can do that. Um, you're going to make sure, though, you dial up your management you know, in, in terms of the rest of your crop management, in terms of scouting, in terms of managing flea beetles, making sure that you're using a good seed treatment, you know, so that you're not getting any uh, seedling diseases, that sort of thing. Um, if you were to push it to 10 plants per square foot, that's on the on the outside end of that range. Um, you know, I, I guess uh, you're gonna have more plants, uh, they may be less branching, uh, you may have more uniformity in terms of the stand, um, and you may even push up the uh, the maturity because more plants mm -hmm. may may bring the, the the entire crop in a little bit sooner. Uh, whereas if you've got a lower end population, you got more side branches. Side branches, of course, have later flowering, you know, and and, and less mature seeds. So um, again, though, when you go with higher planting rates, though, now you got a higher seed cost. Oh, but come Breaker. on. Now. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's a big one. <laughs> it is. We cannot make light of that. Now, okay, so similar question to you, Robert, but I want to take it now sort of the next step, which is in determining that final seeding rate. So what you're going to dial in to when you decide to finally make that pass. And this is where seed size has to play a role. And I love that in canola, we are much more aware of this than maybe we are in our cereals. Um, so Robert, how key is it that we're accounting for the differences in seed size in in dialing in our final seeding rate that we choose when with whatever piece of equipment we're using across the field. All right, I'm going to throw out the old consistent performance uh, term again because I think that's what's critical here. Um, you heard Neil talk about one and a half uh, one and a half pounds or five pounds or seven pounds. What's pounds per acre for canola? 
we've moved on. We're targeting seeds per foot or seeds per meter squared, depending on which side of the bed you get up in the morning. And uh, the you know bottom line is uh, we like the way we're positioning our product now. There's there's ten seeds per square foot uh, in the bag. Uh, do you get ten plants that are ten seeds? No, you don't. It just no, just don't. doesn't happen. And quite frankly, I don't like to see ten seeds uh, per foot in the plant uh, in, in in the field. Why? Because you never see them evenly spaced for one thing. So you end up stacking them on top of each other, and that just causes intercrop competition. And that's just a waste of resources. Ultimately, one of those plants becomes a weed. The other one becomes a crop. One of them takes probably 40% of the resources. The other one takes 60. It's a lose-lose situation. So what's a happy uh, canola crop look like? Well, it varies. And that's, that's the one thing is that's why we, we, we recommend a range of five to seven plants uh, as, as a target. Because you get up to 10 plants per square foot unless you're blessed with the with perfect rain, perfect moisture, and you're lucky enough to be farming in the black soil zone, you just don't have the moisture nutrients to support that dense of population. And the consequence of that is thin little pencil stand canola. And you get those thin stands. And number one problem with that is, uh, well, you do push maturity because you're actually stressing the crop a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, the consequence of that is thinner stands that are more prone to lodging. So if you if it does bushel up, it's more likely to go down. So I like to see you know that five to seven plants to to establish a nice strong stock with some secondary branching. I like to see a little wider floral window as you get you know uh, say a thin thin stand. Sorry, a thin stock. You will generally get a tighter floral window, and that can be susceptible to you know uh, one. One good week of heat blasts might be at the wrong time for you. So those are some of the reasons I like to see a little um, lighter stand. Uh, but I fully agree with the comments from Jack. As we target plant population, we're moving away from broadcasting seed and 10 yeah. pounds of canola seed and say, well, let's feed let's feed a couple plants to the flea beetle gods and we'll, we'll, we'll throw a few more plants to the hail gods and all oh, frost gods, they can have one, one or two plants too. And then we'll end up with five. No, nope, we're going to target a population. We're going to manage them throughout the season. And that's the key to success. They don't go and, and see uh, corn thicker than a hair in a dog's back, hoping that they, they thin themselves out to, to a proper stand. That's how that crop has evolved over time. And our canola crop is evolving along with it at a much rapid, more rapid pace than they did, by the way. Oh my goodness. So we did have some earlier comments about, you know, can we turn canola into corn? Um, and some of these discussions, gentlemen, sound a lot like what we talk about on corn. So there you go. Um, I think maybe we are moving that way now, but this brings in um, the next question to this. And there is a related question on seed size as, you know, our larger seeds, I think we've had this question before, are they more vigorous? Would you be, you know, okay to go uh, a slightly deeper seeding depth with a larger seed? Um, and I think we can make generalizations there. But the key here, if we're aiming for the five to seven alive plants, we, so we don't want 10, we don't want three, we know that canola seed mortality, so from the bag to in the ground, <clears throat> we lose a lot before the flea beetle gods even get a chance. Um, we don't necessarily get a live plant from every seed that goes in. So let's unpack the mortality question a bit. Like Jack, do we, are, do we know, do most farmers know and are measuring their mortality on, on canola seed or not? Well, it's, it's safe to say, Lindsay, I, the researchers know, uh, what the mortality rates are or the, or the, we're turning it the other way, the survivability rates. But I, I can remember one of the first, uh, meetings I sat in with Neil Harker and it was kind of an eye opener for me. He said, yeah, our, you know, our survivability of canola is around 50%. And it was kind of a set me back and I'm, but yeah. he, he showed data in the work that he had done that, yeah, it was around 50%. So, um, <clears throat> That, that's key to know on, on your farm too, because that, okay, 50%. Is that Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Central Alberta? Is it is it a general number? We know that with anything, there's going to be a, a, a quite a range. And so it's key, I think, for farmers to know what's the mortality on your farm or what what's the range of mortality? Let's put it that way. You know, what do you expect on a drier year versus a normal to wet year sort of thing? So that you can gauge um, if, I'm, if I want to end up with five plants, where where what 
you know, how, how much seed am I going to lose? So, um, or how many plants am I, will I lose? So that's where I know the Canola Council of Agronomists were doing a lot of work after doing that establishment, seeing, you know, how many plants do you actually have, um, you know, uh, after, after you've seeded. And that's one thing that I always did a lot of. I always, I still do it today is when I'm scouting a field early spring, um, uh, I'm looking for stand establishment. You know, people are looking for, you know, do we have insect problems, wireworms, cutworms, flea beetles? Um, I'm always taking and measuring and estimating plant density, um, both from my own information, but a lot of times for the, for the, for the farmer, you know, uh, mm -hmm. gee, did you know that you were only getting three plants per square foot? Well, gee, that wasn't what I was planning on. Um, yeah. well, that's what we came up with. So, um, you know, post seeding uh, assessments are are really important to, to find out what is the the mortality range on on your specific farm. Absolutely, Robert, what do you think? I think we can do better than fifty percent survivability consistently. You bet. Like when uh, when we started doing this work about seven years ago now, um, there was very little awareness amongst our uh, customers as to what their actual um, emergence was or their final mortality in the field and uh uh i i can safely say though i really noticed the amount of awareness has increased dramatically uh since that time um there was a time when everybody gave themselves an 85 percent or better or maybe even an a or an a plus because how could you if you just dropped eight hundred thousand dollars on a piece of equipment how could you not give yourself an a plus so uh, that was a general belief, but I think uh, it's it's pretty well understood, and growers are doing you know um, you know doing a much better job. But I want to take it one step further beyond just the emergence challenge. Um, oh, I, I I want to make first one more comment about emergence, so because this is an interesting one, and that it's 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 kind of a watch out, and that and that's a really interesting thing that we observe in our seeding rate trials, because sometimes when, you know, we talked about the one and a half pounds canola, there's really an interesting phenomenon when you're seeding canola and you're changing seed rate. As you drop seed rate, and we see this consistently, say you cut your seed rate in half, you will always see an increase in um, uh, stand establishment or percent emergence. So say if you, so you seeded say uh, 100 seeds per meter squared, and you saw 60% or 55% mortality, 60%. We see that pretty commonly now. So you get six plants out of 10. If you seed 50 seeds per meter squared, well, shouldn't you get 55% or 60%? No, actually, you'll always see 10 or 15% higher. And uh, so that's why it's very important when you're cutting a seeding rate, comparing one drill to the other, that you compare apple to apples because just by lowering your seed rate, you can get actually an increase in percent emergence. Doesn't mean you get more plants, you just get more, a higher percent. And we've researched the daylights out of this to get to the bottom of it. And, you know, there's a number of factors that contribute, but the one factor that stands out is this, the one thing I mentioned before I lost my internet connection was seed to soil contact. And it actually really just becomes a numbers game. So you get a foot of row and you've got 10 seeds that you're trying to put down in that row. Well, what are the, you know, uh, what's the probability of those 10 seeds hitting a piece of trash or hitting a piece of dirt? Right. And when you cut down the number of seeds, what becomes the percent chance that you hit a piece of trash? It actually goes up as a percentage. So it's nothing, I always thought it was biochemical or lilopathy. Oh, you know, there, there was something really special uh, going on. But it's really just a numbers game. And so, uh, you know, it took me a lot. I hate to say how much money I spent figuring that out. It's kind of sad. <laughs> but, um, but, that, that, but that really highlights to me the importance of seed to soil contact. And when we're talking about emergence, yeah. the number one thing, even more important than the drill and, and your setup and your prep, is what you did the fall before for your residue management. That's the most, that's the secret. If you want the secret sauce for getting your canola out of the ground, it happened the fall previous. And, and how good you chopped your straw and, which, and what you did with it. That's number one. Mm -hmm. What about, and we're, this is good though. What about fall weed control where you guys are? So I know in some areas, fall weed control maybe fell off the radar. 
came back. It sort of depends on what kind of fall and what kind of weather we're in. So where has fall weed control sort of landed? Maybe Jack in your area, we'll start there. And it, it's, it's all over, um, yeah. all over the map because sometimes in the fall, we've, if we've had some extremely dry falls, you know, there, there still isn't anything growing and yeah. um, it falls off, literally falls off the radar. Um, yeah. then, then you get a situation where you've got some late, uh, summer or fall moisture, and then you start to get, um, you know, a, a bunch of, of growth of winter annuals and things like that. And, um, unfortunately, sometimes we, we get a little complacent and well, we didn't spray last year. So do we need to spray again in, in the fall, you know, and, and, um, yeah, post harvest, uh, uh, weed control sometimes is really a hit and miss. And yeah. um, again, is again, um, it, it's much like dealing with a lot of growers that are in the drier areas. You know, it's even again situation with pre seed. You know, I don't see anything growing. There's the, you know, we've had yeah. many some springs where people have skipped the pre seed because uh, there's nothing here growing. Why would I spray? Uh, so it's the same thing in the yeah. fall. So it very it is very hit and miss and, and uh, mm -hmm. tough to count on. Yeah, Rob, similar story. You're in. I mean, you guys aren't that far apart, so. No, but uh, we've been, you know, we've no, no, no great secret. We've been dry, uh, been dry for a while. So crops haven't been as thick as they could be. And uh, so like fall weed control for uh, uh, thistles is still good bang for your buck. And so yeah. we see a lot of fall wheel control targeting some of these tough to control thistles that really um, do well in a situation where there's a little less crop competition than we'd like to see. So uh, weather's been pretty good for thistles. Yes, there's always something that thrives, right? That's there's yeah. yes, biology yeah. will find its niche. Um, I want to send a shout out quick to Alan. He's watching from Winnipeg and he says, please smash that like button. I love it. Um, it is YouTube after all. So there you go. Thanks, Alan. That's a great shout out. Um, now there's a few things. So John, John's here in Ontario. Um, and John, I think you are in in like gray Bruce, gray Bruce area. So He's asking about sort of winter canola, spring canola. So one of the things I'm going to say, John, because we'll probably touch on this um, in the fall, but if you want to compare like Manitoba type conditions, there's this, not so much Saskatchewan, but Manitoba type conditions is most likely or most like Northern Ontario. It is really hard to compare just about anything we do in Southern Ontario and even as far East as I am uh, with anything that we do in the prairies. So it's a lot it's just so different based on, um, yeah, Bruce County. Yeah. So just growing season, um, moisture. So you will find pockets that would be similar, but it is really hard to cover, um, how different these are, but we will, I promise we're going to do more on winter canola again, uh, because there's just such growing interest here in Ontario. Um, and that brings up all sorts of great, um, yeah, Thunder Bay. So yeah, like Northern, what, what we in Ontario call Northern Ontario to me is just East because it's just east of Manitoba. It's not north, it's east. But anyway, um, okay, there was a question and I do wanna hit on this quickly before uh, we go to our last shout out to our sponsor. Um, and then I've got two more questions for the last part of the show that I think uh, we'll have a little bit of fun with. But um, there was the question of seed size. So I glossed over it a bit. I do wanna get, Robert, I'll start with you. Does seed size make a difference in vigor depth these because there is a pretty big range between small canola seed and large canola seed but does it really play out in any sort of vigor or or other scenario you know we've um good question comes up all the time uh yeah. you know does size matter with canola seed and uh, uh i can say confidently uh with the uh, in vigor canola seed that across the seed size range we beat this research question to death. Um, yeah. You know, comparing A range size seed to B to C to D, um, you know, we put it in demos uh, and, uh, you know, walk customers through the demo plots. Don't put the, si the, the signs on front of you and, and ask, ask us, you tell me which is the small seed, uh, which is the yeah. large seed. And, uh, you know, they got a one in four chance of getting it right. And, uh, I. I, you rarely see see it get it right. It's very hard to tell. You know, there's there's other factors actually that differentiate one lot to to another that probably make more difference in the absolute seed size. So the thing, thing to keep in mind is, you know, like I, I talked about uh, uh, seed and canola thirty years ago. That's a different canola seed than what we're handling handling today. And 
was there a difference in terms of vigor and seed size if I say compare our rapa seed from from 20 right. 25 years ago to our standard op seed absolutely was there a difference in how it would handle seeding depth absolutely uh you know uh we saw the clip from neil neil showed very eloquently in, in his work that there was a difference in the performance of the seed based on the size but you got to keep in mind the fraction of the seed lot that he was comparing to was a size of seed that we don't even put in the bag anymore and yeah. that that's what's really changed and yeah is the seed you know it's it's we're, we're, we're not selling ball bearings, but uh, uh, the, the, the seeds got a, packs a pretty good punch regardless of the seeds, seed size range. All righty. Okay. With that, we're going to take a quick uh, shout out to our show sponsors for tonight. And then I've got a couple questions to wrap up the hour. Our sponsors for the agronomists are Adama Canada, U.S. Borax, and FMC Preschool. Weeds constantly evolve, but so can your integrated pest management strategies. Knowing the latest weed pressures, resistance trends, application techniques, management strategies, herbicide science, and more gives you the tools for a proactive, agronomically responsible response. Go to www.fmcpreschool.com for recorded webinars from field experts and curated articles. fmcpreschool.com, your knowledge, your business, your success. I was just telling producer Jay that this hour is flying by and I can't believe we've only got 10 minutes left. Um, so this is, so thanks to both of you for making that happen because this is uh, fascinating and um, I'm having a great time and it really is nice that I get to ask the questions. Um, of course, we've got some great ones in the chat and that's one of the ones I want to start with. So Jason Vogt out of Manitoba early on made a comment and I think it's one that does tie together some of the themes that we've talked about today and it is, Okay, so canola can surprise us. It can be very plastic. It can compensate. But consistency is sometimes elusive. And sometimes we're, you know, perhaps, I know Manitoba was a bit disappointed last year with some verticillium that, that snuck in. Um, are we getting closer to, or how do we create sort of more corn-like, more consistent results from our canola crop? Jack, I'll maybe start with you. Well, it goes with with what Rob has been talking about in terms of you know the consistency and if we you know set set the the stage so we've got consistency that we're dealing with. So if we can um, fine tune our our seating depth so that we know that we're within you know that uh, inch to inch and a half or whatever where we need for moisture. Um, if we're consistent with knowing what our mortality rates are, we know what we need to to plant to get um, six plants per square foot um established um and and then and then the other aspects of that in terms of goes with the weed control did we do a good job of pre-seed weed control are we doing a good job of, of staying on top of pests are we using good seed treatments um and and that sort of thing so it, it you know it's not hard to grow a canola crop but trying to grow a really good canola crop seems to separate uh, you know the, the leaders from from those that are just average and 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 that seems to be where i think we, we, we tend to look is, you know, I, I talk to some people, oh, I'm still only getting 40 bushel, 45 bushel canola on, you know, in, in my area because it tends to be drier and more, I would say, inhospitable versus growing canola in central Saskatchewan or central Alberta where, um, you know, environment is a little more cooperative in terms of temperature and moisture and, and not having the wide swing, swings. So, you know, we, we can grow good canola if we're in areas that are facing the environment, I think tends to be the trump card on a lot of things. Um, you know, uh, we have to be on top of the game in those areas more than we do um, in, in areas where we got more stable, more stable environment. Robert, similar question to you. How do we build this consistency in our, in our canola crop? Well, the best new planter can't make it rain. Um, but the, uh, but, Seeding, uh, seeding is one thing a grower has control over. And really mm -hmm. it's about setting the crop up for its best chance of success. That's all you can do. And then, you know, all the management inputs that go in after, that's again, just enabling the crop to have its best chance of success. The target populations we talked about, we really believe those are the right, 
that's the right population again to give the crop its best chance of success uh, under a wide under a wide range of conditions. To the to the um, uh, to the growers' uh, comment though about you know uh, inconsistency and whatnot, I've got to throw out there though rotation. You know, mm -hmm. just in canola so hard with these rotations. Uh, I, I'm unfortunately all we can ex all we can expect out of that is inconsistencies because we're just you know pressuring the system so hard you know like the best drill in the world is not going to not going to address that so the mm -hmm. um you know bottom line is rotation and i uh, and and i mentioned residue management and mm -hmm. target your population and you're going to set your crop up for its best chance of success given the wide range of conditions we experience in western canada and east let's not forget that folks in yeah. the east Absolutely. And I want to send a quick thank you to Rob Miller, uh, who is watching and uh, hopping in here that spring canola works great in Bruce County for John. Um, and uh, heat blast is one of your challenges, uh, which, of course, is still a challenge for the West as well. Uh, it's just that timing of when that crop comes into flower. Um, so, so yeah, so that's pretty, so it's pretty cool. John wants to know where it goes in, in the rotation, which, Rob, I'm glad this might be the first show that we haven't got to rotation until near the end. Because usually I throw it at the beginning so that we don't miss it. Um, but uh, we do have some typical rotations, John. And the, the key here is actually rotate, not alternate. So Ontario is addicted to soy corn and the West is addicted to wheat canola. Just throw some more crops in there, everybody. Um, which I know, John, I know you're doing. I just I just kid. Um, but yes. that does. Was Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, snow is not a rotational crop. Snow is not, no, and there's no money in snow. Um, that's right. So last, sort of to round this out, because one of the things that, you know, we were talking, the focus really was today about, you know, sort of pre-seed and the seeding pass. So we're, we're not necessarily talking the early, early season, uh, but I do want to touch on just quickly, uh, because we'll, we'll certainly follow up in upcoming episodes on the pest front. But if we, if I'm going to give you, Diseases, weeds, and insects, you can choose which one. But my question to you is, for the canola crop, for 2023, um, which pest, disease, weed, or insect, which one is the biggest sort of on your radar? Jack, I'll start with you. You can take a moment. It, okay, it, 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 It'll be flea beetles. Uh, yeah. We've seen the flea beetle populations have been building since 2019, 2020. We've had some problems. Last year, honestly... Um, I saw some of the heaviest damage that I've ever seen with flea beetles. And, yeah. and we had growers that sprayed three, four. I, I heard even in some situations where they sprayed five times um, to, to control flea beetles. So, and, and then this past fall, I heard again of, you know, people saying, gosh, I'm seeing lots of areas with uh, adult flea beetles in the fall. And you're going, oh boy, here we go again. Um, mm -hmm. So it's certainly one that's uh, in the forefront. Um, last year was really bad. And uh, I, you know, I, I anticipate that we're going to have to be on top of flea beetles again this coming spring. Mm -hmm, absolutely. All right, Robert, what about for you? Uh, you know, I can't disagree. Um, I'm worried about flea beetles this coming spring, uh, but I've been fooled before. Uh, I, I, you know, we've gone into, uh, we've, uh, well, back when we used to swath all our canola, I can remember uh, distinctly having the, the glass covered in flea beetles and the swather you know, front to back and thinking it's going to be the worst flea beetle season ever uh, the next spring. And then really beetles being absent. So fingers crossed that uh, they're, they're not so predictable. Like uh, that's all I'd say. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. So I, I guess that question then, uh, because this has come up, we've been covering this over this winter, of course, uh, last year was an incredibly difficult season for flea beetles in a lot of geographies um so that that was definitely a challenge and so there has been some discussion because of course we saw in manitoba there was canola that went in late um and that fared better on the flea beetle side um but that but then there's the discussion of yeah jason says welcome to my world um the then there is that discussion of you know, if you're the first one in and the first crop up, does that just make you a target? Should we be assessing moving canola later in the seeding season if flea beetles are our biggest concern? It's a tough one. Jack, do you want to tell that me is no? A, 
<laughs> that is a <laughs> tough one. Uh, you know, that that's a rock and a hard place. Um, yeah, you, you know, if you if you move back your seating date, um, now you're running the risk of, uh, especially for Southern Alberta, Southern Saskatchewan, the, the heat blast. Um, yeah. You know, so much work that was done for in, in, in Southern Saskatchewan, Southern Alberta, again, um, you know, again, with, with drier conditions. Seeding early usually has always produced the best results because you're able to capture that early spring moisture. Um, the crop is developing, you know, sooner before you got the, the really hot days of summer. Um, you know, they've seen some uh, very good advantages to that. So that that's going to be a tough one to, um, you know, to, 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 to manage. You know, the other aspect I saw was actually flea beetles were so bad this past year. I even saw mustard crops that were really just hammered. And of course, that's one of the things that plant breeders have been looking at. They're saying, well, what if we breed, you know, uh, uh, canola plants to have more hairs on them? Because, you know, the right, flea yeah. beetles will find that. Well, I, I saw mustard plants. I've got pictures of mustard plants that were hammered and uh, with flea beetles. So yeah. if, if circumstances get severe enough, is that, you know, what what are we giving up and what are we gaining? And I, I don't know what the best answer for that is, Lindsay, but yeah, that, that's a tough, that's a yeah. tough one to, to weigh up the pros and the cons. Mm -hmm. Robert, any thoughts on if we're there yet? Are we moving it's to a, seating it, date? It's a trade-off, like, you know, uh, research clearly demonstrates the, um, uh, the advantages of early seeding in terms of yield. Like we can get best bang for our buck if, for, uh, if you're targeting high yield canola, is getting in early. Uh, don't delay seeding. But these, you know, it's pretty unprecedented times these past couple seasons with flea beetle population. But we saw crops that ne wasn't necessarily seeded quote unquote, late get really hammered by flea beetle uh, this year as well. So it's it's not a it's not it's not a cure uh, by mm -hmm. by any means. So um, I, I'm still a um, I'm a fan of early seeding. Um, manage the frost uh check your calendar and get the crop in so um uh because that's where uh you're leaving a lot of yield potential on the table and second mm -hmm. uh jack already you know uh the the threat of the heat blast is very real and there's no way to dodge that you know there's really no remedy for that at least we have remedies for the flea beetle and i think we're certainly learning as well the importance of uh of early detection and early application because, you know, uh, uh, this year we saw the prevalence of, uh, well, we saw kind of a comeback in our area of the cruciferate beetle, like cause okay. kind of the scrapers yep. were kind of on the rise. And, uh, but this year we got hit with the cruciferate as well. And uh, it was kind of the double whammy with cruciferate and, and the stripers both, both uh, attacking the plants that were really ravaging it. And, uh, you know, really uh, making early detection and early application important. And uh, yeah, that's all. I, I don't have a solution. Uh, I wish I did. Walk your fields and walk them again. It, it is amazing to me how quickly the, they can just spread, but in numbers just grow. So it is just so crucial that uh, you're out there. Um, Ray, <laughs> I really love this comment because this is how my brain thinks. Uh, early, so plant a trap crop, wait for your neighbor, neighbor to seed, then seed after them. Um, <laughs> there you go. It's always the neighbor that takes it for the team. All right. Um, okay. Thank you so much uh, to all to our show sponsors, of course. Uh, that's Adama Canada, FMC Preschool, and US Borax. We do appreciate the support. Um, and thank you, of course, to everyone in the comments. Uh, those of you who asked your questions offered some uh, support and some answers for uh, for John. Thank you, Rob, for for being here in the chat as well. And I do appreciate all the questions and comments and uh, and raise solutions to most things, most things. And uh, yeah, and Robert, thank you for your first visit here on the show. We'll have you back again. You're welcome. And Jack, thank you again for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right. And next Monday, we are we're taking it from the West's corn to the East's actual corn so next week we are talking corn um establishment as well so see we've got a theme going on so join us next week 8 p.m eastern uh on youtube facebook twitter or you know realagriculture.com slash agronomists all right thanks everyone we'll see you next week cheers <laughs>